Hello everyone and welcome to a lecture over the first chapter in our A Plus Guide to IT Technical Support book which is the ninth edition. As you know CompTIA has changed the A Plus exam and put the 801 and 802 exams to sunset as of June 2016 and we are now using the 901 and 902 A Plus certification exams. So this book will go over the changes that have included the new objectives for the 901 and 902 CompTIA A plus exam. Let's go ahead and we'll talk about the different objectives over this first chapter. First of all we want to be able to identify the various parts that are inside a desktop computer case and once we look inside those we want to be able to describe how those components connect together and are compatible. We need to be able to identify the various ports, slots, and those internal components of a laptop computer and explain any type of special concerns when supporting and maintaining laptops. We also want to be able to describe various hardware components in mobile devices and types of wired as well as wireless connections mobile devices can utilize. And then lastly, our last objective is to describe the purpose of various tools you will need as a computer hardware technician and throughout the series you'll hear me use the word IT toolbox a lot because as an IT technician we need to have all kinds of tools for various situations that are going to arise. Well when it comes to the cases we use the term computer case kind of roughly. Um, a computer case in generally in historically we use the term chassis in the IT world and this chassis or computer case is going to hold your power supply, your motherboard, the processor, various memory modules, any expansion cards that might be installed, of course your hard drives whether it be spinning disk or solid state drives, optical drives as well as other types of drives that can be part of that computer case. Now we have different types of cases we have tower cases as you can see up here to the top left this is a tower case it stands upright and it can hold several different drives and they come in many different flavors we also have the desktop case you can see an example of that over here to the right and these generally are going to lie flat as well as they're kind of multi-purpose in most areas you'll see that someone sits there monitor up on top of that as well so it kind of is an ergonomic raising so your neck isn't bending as much to see your display so they just kind of inherited that uh, additional feature by allowing people to just hold their monitor on there. We also have mobile cases and we have all-in-one cases so there's lots of varieties and you can see I have some examples here of an all-in-one and this is kind of it's used as an all-in-one computer everything is built in to this one piece. We have our display, we have our ports, we have our memory, our uh, storage, all of that built into one. You can see that this one is using Bluetooth technology for its mouse and keyboard so the only wires that are there for this unit is the power that's going to the wall outlet. And the recent surge here in late 2016 or probably started around 2014 is the desire to have a two-in-one device so that we can use it as a tablet or a laptop and then of course as I said we have mobile devices too the mobile cases are used with laptops and tablets and you can see here's an example of a tablet here and those are the uh, all of us want to use our tablets as we have in the past with desktop PCs and laptops so it's whatever flavor you're into but as a 901 and 902 objectives we need to know about all of these. So now that you've seen that, now you know what we're going to be working over over the next several weeks through this course and in this first chapter it's pretty much broken down into a four parts in which we're looking at what's inside the desktop case, a kind of a first look at laptop components and then a first look at mobile device hardware and then our fourth part of the chapter will be tools that are used by a computer hardware technician. So let's take a look at that what's inside the case aspect here as we jump right into our ports. And these are very important to know. As you can see I have a couple ports listed here. The top one is one that's maybe becoming a legacy device here in the next few years as this is 
the VGA port and typically we call this, and historically though some people uh, disagree with it, that the DB15, because there are 15 ports here on this for the male 15 pins to connect to to establish our link. Uh, you'll see this is just called the DB15, the HD15, DE15, a lot of different names. We, we get the D out of that as it's kind of a D shape. So if we could flip this round, you would see this is the left leg of the D and then the curve that goes out to the right. So that's why a lot of those connectors will have that called a D because of the actual shape. Now one of the reasons that this is becoming a legacy port as it in, it will be disappearing in the next several years is that this is an carries an analog signal as opposed to digital signal and the analog signal just means it's a continuous signal and there's it has an infinite variation so when we talk about digital as you know everything digital is ones and zeros so the digital signal is much better and can carry our information better so you will still see this VGA or DB15 port on several monitors televisions, various items, and it's still used a lot if we don't need a digital signal. Um, and a lot of times people just don't want to replace things, so that's why we still have items that take that VGA port. A lot of laptops will have those still on them, and they're still being shipped with those on them, but for the most part, we're trying to move into the digital ones, such as the HDMI that everybody's getting accustomed to. We also have the S-Video port here and you can look at the shape of that. Now this, there are two types of these. It can either be a four pin or a seven pin. This is for video information. And you may see these around and you might see them on old devices, on older DVD players, uh, definitely not on Blu-ray players, but you may still see them on some laptops and computers and some expansion cards that people have installed for video. Now let's take a look at some more of the ports that you should be able to see on a computer case. You'll see I have several different ones here. I've included the DB15 as a reminder, and I kind of blew it up a little bit here so you can see those three rows of five at DB15. And here again is that same port that I just recalled. Do you remember what it was? Hopefully right away you said it's the S-Video port. All right, and to the right of that here, you will see that we have a new one that we're introducing here. And this port is also a video port. This is the DVI, and it stands for Digital Video Interface. Now you'll be able to identify these DVI ports based on that general look of the rows of female ports there. And there are a few different styles that we'll go over in later chapters. Now this does support both digital or analog video. So remember that as a big difference between the DB15 and the DVI. DB15 or VGA port is analog only and the DVIs based on the type can be analog or digital. Now the most common port that we see now on today's technology is the HDMI or High Definition Multimedia Interface Port. Now this is going to transmit not only video but also audio. Now this is digital so it's not an analog transmission. And we use this to connect to many different devices for home theater and our usage whether it's DVD players, Blu-ray players, if we're just connecting to a television, whatever the case may be, we want the highest quality. We're using HDMI and you see it everywhere. Next to that is a display port and you may or may not have seen this but these are what was put into place to try to replace the VGA ports, the DB15s as well as those DVI ports but it really has not taken off as what is expected in the market. These are digital and it's just like the HDMI in that it transmits both digital video and audio. Right, the next port to the right of that is our Thunderbolt port. Now this is this type of port is going to allow the transmission of video data and power all on the same port and cable. And we've mainly seen this in use on Apple computers. Now you'll see that it's very similar to the display port 
and it is compatible with most DisplayPort devices. Next to that you will see something that hopefully all of you have seen or used on different devices and that is what a lot of us need and that's the network port. We also call this an Ethernet port or an RJ45 port because that is the connection that is on the cable that goes into this port is called an RJ45 connector. And we use this on Ethernet cables and using that we've gone through different transitions of Ethernet cables with most people now using CAT6 cabling for their Ethernet cabling. And this is what allows us to be able to connect to wired networks to hopefully be able to get on to the old interweb or internet. So this allows us if we don't have a good connection there or if we see that the lights aren't on, that's a good indicator of when we're troubleshooting that maybe that is the reason that it's in the port, the cable, or the connection to there for us not being able to get on the internet or company network. Now we'll take a look at audio ports and those are listed down here on the bottom left. These are pretty easy to recognize because they are round ports, round female ports. So those are typically how we will identify those and a system will usually have several of those based on what we are needing, whether we need it for a microphone or if we need it, some audio coming into our device or if we're transmitting audio out to like speakers and different possibly a stereo. There's all kinds of different cabling that can be used for audio on our systems. Typically if you have an audio cable to connect to a speaker or earbuds you plug it into generally the lime green sound port in the middle of these three ports. And These are generally three and a half millimeter ports and a common standard is that pink port to be used for a microphone. In that same area of audio here, you'll see this one here to the left, and I have that pulled out here, and that is a specific connection for home theaters. That is the SPDIF, or Sony Phillips Digital Interface Sound Port. SPDIF, Sony Phillips Digital Interface. This connects to an external home theater through a specific cable to allow for best quality for those products. The SPDIF ports also are going to carry digital audio and can work with some of our electrical and or optical cables. Next we will move on to what's one of the most standard ports that almost all of us probably recognize right away and that is a USB or universal serial bus port. And this allows for input output and many different sizes, different flavors, whether we are looking at USB 2.0 which is faster than the original USB and then USB 3.0 which is much faster than 2.0 and we will go over those later on in other chapters. So we have just a few more ports to go through in which you should be able to identify on site. This one in the top left here uh, may look like similar to another one but in all actuality it is its own it's called a firewire port. We also call this the IEEE 1394 port and there's a couple different flavors of this that we'll identify later on in other chapters but we generally call this the firewire port or IEEE 1394 port and we use this port for high-speed multimedia devices such as digital camcorders and recorders uh, you may have cameras that use this as well but generally that is pretty much uh, it's very limited as to where you will see this firewire port being used. Next you will see these ports here that look very similar to our USB but they're not USB they are external SATA ports or eSATA ports and we usually have these for using an external hard drive or some other type of device that uses an eSATA interface. The reason we use that is because eSATA is much faster than firewire and some other technologies so you may see these, you may use these if you have like an external hard drive you may have used that for your digital storage of your products or your your documents, your pictures, various items and then you have that external hard drive that you usually put up into a safe or somewhere safe or you have an on-site location for keeping that important data backed up in case something happens to your original system. Well here at the top right you will see some other items that 
once again may be coming legacy technology in the next few years. And these are what's called a PS2 port. You might also hear them referred to as a mini DIN. These are a six pin port. If you look at the female ports there, one, two, three, four, five, six. This are typically used for keyboards and mice that are wired to your computer. So these are, like I said, some legacy because most of us use USB or Bluetooth now, but you may still see these and be an area for troubleshooting. Some handheld scanners also use the PS2 port, uh, typically the purple one as that is an input for the keyboard. And on some systems you may actually see an embossed here on the plate a visual icon as to what that PS2 or mini DIN is required for. A troubleshooting piece of information here, if someone has plugged the mouse into the wrong port and the keyboard in the wrong port, you'll notice things aren't working. Trace those, usually on those PS2 mice and keyboards, they are color coded as the purple and green is pretty standard. On some off brands you will see that they may be the same color on that card. So you may just have to do some troubleshooting physically with plugging them in, plugging them back in, and seeing if they connect. Typically when it comes to PS2 devices you have to restart the computer for those to be detected. So if you just unplug them, swap them, plug them back in, typically it won't work. You'll have to reboot the system and then the system will recognize those devices as needed. Here's some. Here's a legacy port here. This is the what's called the old serial port or the DB9 port and you can see this is a male connection and there are nine pins there for the connection and this male port is used on really old computers uh, we've tried to get away from serial type communication and we've gone to using USB ports as a standard uh, you might come across an old router in a business that uses that there may be some other devices that can connect to that through that if at all possible I would look at trying to recommend upgrading those devices away from the serial port. Another older port here is the 25 pin female port here. This is called a parallel port. Sometimes you refer to this and you'll see it actually if you're ever hooking up a printer as an LPT port. So the parallel port, LPT port, 25 pin port, lots of different names for this. But once again we've replaced this by USB. And lastly we'll look at the modem port here. We also call this an RJ11 port and you can see that this RJ11 is not as wide as this RJ45 port here. So this RJ11 here is for old analog telephone or POTS lines and it was used to connect dial-up phone lines to computers. It kinda looks like the network port but like I said it's not as wide. Now take a deep breath as that's all the ports we're going to cover at this point before we move on to the next material. But I just want you to get a good feeling of the ports and what they're used for. You will definitely need to be able to identify those and know their purposes.